and it's a pleasure to be with you. So yeah, I mean, I'm going to talk for about half an hour today about uh, archive docs. Um, so you may have noticed my, my background is it itself an archival document that has recently been released by BBC Archive. They've made over 100 empty BBC sets available for creative reuse. So you may may notice that it's uh, the, the set from Porridge, a sitcom back in the 70s for some of you of a certain age. And so this is the kind of material that can be, uh, you know, creatively reused by filmmakers on the theme of self-isolation, I guess. So I thought it was fitting for, for today's event. Um, so I have a presentation. So I'm going to share my screen and, uh, and guide you through the presentation. We're going to watch a couple of short clips. Zoom is not great for uh, watching videos, so I'll limit, to, limit it to a minute or two. Um, and you'll notice that as I go through, many of the links in the presentation are hot links to kind of internet sites. So we'll be posting the PDF of the presentation afterwards. So you'll have all of those links to browse as you uh, embark on your, uh, hopefully embark on your six minute project for the, the latest competition from Bertha Dockhouse. So without further ado, um, let me just go to my presentation. So I'll just share a screen and bring that up. Hopefully you can see it um, and give you a little bit of background um, for myself. Um, so my own background, currently I lead the Archives for Education project, which makes 39 documentaries from the BFI National Archive and BBC Archive available for creative reuse by student filmmakers. So essentially that means that up to two minutes of uh, up to two minute excerpts or clips from, from those films can be used at the starting point for a student project to give them the, 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 the starting idea uh, for their films and also to begin to connect uh, archive footage from their parents or grandparents generations to their lives today. And then through that um, exploration of representation and time, um, make a, a richer uh, documentary that spans generations. And also uh, in terms of our current situation, um, obviously people are drawing on archive uh, increasingly to, um, you know, I guess as a substitute for being able to film in under normal circumstances. So you'll see on the right hand side, um, back to the public service films of the post World War II era and a director called Rich Richard Massingham, who was actually um, a doctor in a fever hospital before he started making films. So he seems kind of an uh, for a second and show you a little excerpts from Coughs and Sneezes, which has become um, more relevant to us today uh, recently. So um, let me just share this with you. Sorry, I have to come out of my presentation here. Okay. Bear with me here. Um, okay, so this is um, the first 30 seconds. You may have met a few people who like doing this sort of thing. They're a nuisance, I agree, but pretty harmless. You have certainly seen problems like this. They're not a nuisance, they're a real danger. Hi, stop it, you. Stop it, stop it. Come here, what do you think you're up to? You've probably infected thousands of people already. What do you think this is for? Yes, that's all right, but here's another way of using your hang. Okay, so I'll stop that there, but um, that's an example that, uh, of, you know, a piece of archive film that could potentially be the starting point um, for a film of yours for this competition. Let me just go back into my PowerPoint here. And there are, there are others where that came from. Um, so you can see that he, he made a number of films in the 40s that have some relevance. Handkerchief Drill actually takes some of the same footage and repurposes it with question and answers. So that might be an alternative clip that you could use if you're interested in that particular one. And then somebody has actually made gifts uh, to go along with that material as well. So um, that was made by <clears throat> the, um, the UK government, the Crown. And, and so um, the copyright has lapsed. So now it's available through uh, Internet Archive um, for you to use. So I've got the links there so you can have a look at it at your, at your leisure. So just on the, on the theme of um, where to find digital archive uh, material, I've got two slides here in terms of where you can find it in the UK and also where you can find it in the US. So as I mentioned, the Archives for Education scheme 
At the moment, it's, it's only open to students in higher education, but we are hoping to expand it to young filmmakers through schools and training organizations. So keep, keep tuned for that. Uh, Scotland on screen. Also, if you have a, an academic login, you can access some of their material that you can download and, and creatively reuse. But if you're not a student, there's also a lot of other material you can use. Um, the British Council, sorry, my presentation here. Um, the British Council Film Archive operate under a Creative Commons license. So you're free to remix and adapt um, some of their material in their collection. And, and the London Community Video Archive has a lot of uh, community videos made in the late 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s which you can access on the website. It'll send you to Vimeo, where you can download many of those films and repurpose them. Um, but do remember, if you're going to show, show them publicly, do ask for permission from the LCBA to be able to do that. Britain from Above is a, a website I stumbled on recently that has aerial photographs. You basically put in your um, postcode and you can find aerial photographs of your local community from the early 20th century on which is a really fascinating resource. And then Pexels is uh, a website, I think it may be based in the US, but it has stock footage um, from all over the world um, in terms of stills, in terms of video, in terms of audio that you can, again, freely use. Um, and then you have YouTube resources. I mean, nowadays, institutions like 10 Downing Street and other good government organizations, any of their events, they'll upload to YouTube in HD quality. So again, that's the kind of material that you'll be able to use and repurpose for any social or political commentary you may want to make on, on the current situation. Um, in terms of the US, um, we've got the Prelinger Archives, which is a very eclectic collection of generally publicly domain material that you can use, and it's part of the Internet Archive. Which, which has many, many different collections you can browse through um, for different uh, public domain material. Generally in the US, anything created by the government is seen as public domain, so it has no copyright attached to it, so you're free to use it. Um, generally, you'll be able to download material in MPEG-2, which is kind of the, the equivalent of DVD quality, and then you can um, export that into whatever format you're editing with. Another great source in the US is the US National Archives. And again, the great thing about the last few years with the, the digitization process is that they're now digitizing and uh, actually uploading to YouTube in HD quality. So whereas you used to be able to get it just maybe in 360 quality on YouTube, which, which wouldn't be great once you've converted and started editing and um, look maybe a bit pixelated, now you can uh, download this material in very high quality. Sorry, I seem to be slipping around here in my presentation. Um, another two links here. Um, the Library of Congress National Screening Room and the National Film Preservation Foundation, they specialize in preserving archive film. Um, again, when they digitize, they do it at very high quality and um, many of the films they make available for, from da for download from their website because obviously public funding was involved in the digitization. So if you're looking at a non-UK or just a, just a global perspective, some of that footage is really amazing. Um, and then NASA, um, all of their stuff is public domain. And again, they uh, make it available in the HD quality on their website, whether it's images or video library. Um, and I, there's another uh, website for the Hubble telescope, which broadcasts live images from the Hubble telescope, um, which you can also dip into if, if that's your thing. The public domain review is a, a very eclectic blog, which collates a lot of public domain material from around the world, be it imagery, um, sound or image or, or moving image um, from the 18th, 19th, 20th century. So uh, that's actually where I found the, um, the Richard Massingham film that I showed you earlier. So I'd recommend that. And also YouTube channels uh, such as the White House and so on, um, which you can, uh, you can where, you, where you can find material to adapt if you want to uh, comment on any political goings on in the US or indeed if you're even watching this from the US. Okay, so. Um, Moving on to the next slide, um, that sorts you out hopefully on the visual level, but in terms of sound effects and music libraries, there's also an amazing array of uh, audio material available. BBC Sound Effects is a library of 16,000 sound effects uh, collated by BBC over the years, which is now available for you for creative use under a non-commercial license. YouTube also has its own audio library uh, hidden away, but there's a link for you there. And the musician Moby um, has made some of his music available for use on a non-commercial basis in um, films by young filmmakers. 
and also uh, Ben Sound and Free to Use Sounds or a couple of other sites that have um, music that you can use under Creative Commons type licenses. The backgrounds that I mentioned earlier, my, my, the Porridge background that I'm using tonight, um, that link is there also and um, that's been released I think by BBC Archive last week. So that's another resource you can, you can dip into um, to, you know, enrich what could otherwise be a quite flat uh, Zoom background if you're interviewing people that way. Okay, moving on to how to use it legally. Um, I've talked about public domain, which essentially means there's no copyright attached to the footage, probably, be, probably because um, the government created it or the copyright wasn't initially uh, registered um, with the relevant uh, authorities. Um, it, it, but it, but that, that kind of changes by country, so um, it's quite a complicated thing to get into. Um, the other way we can use uh, material legally is to do it on their Creative Commons license. So I have a link there to the main Creative Commons website where there are a number of different licenses specifying what the owner of the material uh, who uploaded it to the Creative Commons site or uploaded it to their own website for sharing as specified you can do with their um, original material. So in the case of the British Council Film Archive and Wikimedia, Wikimedia Commons, for example, you're free to use the material under an attribution non-commercial 3.0 license. And you can see that the license spells out what you're able to do with it. So in this case, you're able to share it and you're also able to adapt it. So you're able to remix, transform and build upon the material um, under the following terms. So as long as you give appropriate credit to the source material, indicate if any changes were made in your use of the material and not use it for commercial purposes. So if you want to use it commercially or if somebody sees your film and they then want to screen it on TV or whatever, then you, do, you just get in touch with the original rights holder and you negotiate um, a license with them. Um, as well as Creative Commons licenses, and you'll see uh, the little CC logo, um, perhaps on, either on the British Council Film Archive website or on Flickr or on, on whatever kind of uh, website you go to where you're looking to, to find shared content. We can also rely on copyright exceptions. Um, so I'll give you an idea of what they are here. Um, probably the best website um, in the UK to look, look for is copyrightuser.org. So the top three links uh, in the presentation here in this particular slide um, all point you to copyrightuser.org, um, which has a, a huge amount of information on uh, copyright and creative use across film, music, sound, etc. So the main, um, the main things you've got to be aware of, I think, are what's called fair dealing in the UK and fair use in the US. So it basically means for, the, for, for certain limited purposes, we're allowed to use a certain amount of archive material, even from a copyrighted uh, piece of work, uh, for certain uh, for certain uses. So under UK copyright law, the two except the two main exceptions that would be of interest to you would be for quotation, criticism, and review, which means you're either either quoting the work to 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 make a particular point or make it a, make a particular argument. Um, you might be critiquing the work, and obviously you need to reference. Uh, the work you're critiquing in order for, for it to make sense to the viewer and, uh, and also for review. So the main thing here is that you're, you're only using what you need to use from the source material. You're not using it for entertainment purposes. You're not causing any economic harm to the rights holder using a big 10 minute chunk of, a, of an 80 minute film, which means somebody won't go out and buy the DVD or stream it online. You're only using that little bit of, of footage that you need to make your point, to make your argument, to illustrate your argument. So if you wanna go into finer detail, you can, you can click on that link and, uh, and have a look at that. And, and the second exception we could talk about would be parody and pastiche. So obviously if you're parodying or pastiching something, we need to see the source material to understand what you're doing to it. Um, so again, uh, it's a limited exception in terms of only using um, what you need, the, the length of clip you need to make your point and, and to make your parody or pastiche. But again, that is enshrined in the, in the legislation, so it's illegal for you to, to do that, even with copyrighted material. And then finally, in this section, um, I point you to the Learning on Screen Copyright Guidance, which is, which is written um, by one of the originators of copyright user, Bart Maletti, who's a, a, one of the experts in the UK on copyright and creative reuse. And he also runs a course with Learning on Screen, which is free for Learning on Screen members. I think there's another one coming up in mid-June. Um, so you may be interested in that as well. 
Okay, so i just move on to my next slide. So, so thinking about um, the creative response to self-isolation competition that uh, Bertha, Bertha Dockhouse have te themed around uh, the power of archives um, for the month of June. Um, obviously the government guidance at the moment is that, um, you know, you should, going outside, we should be in groups of no more than two, which obviously makes filmmaking quite difficult. Um, but there is a lot you can do um, just just within a, a domestic setting wherever you're living um in terms of working with our archive it's it's possible to make a found footage film which means that all of the all of the footage in the film is found footage so you didn't actually shoot anything yourself you're just remixing uh footage you find on the internet or, or, or footage you find elsewhere and um and, and making an argument or, or telling a story that way but um, generally in my work with Archive with students, uh, we use the archive as a starting point and as a way of anchoring the film and setting out an agenda for the film, which we, we then find a way to connect the, these fragments of archive with our modern experience um, through the eyes of the filmmaker. So I guess at the beginning of this process, if you're, if you're fairly new to this, or even if you're, you know, uh, you've made a few films, but you never made a documentary, never made an archival film, um, I think your key questions would be, what question or theme are you exploring in your film? And maybe you don't know, and maybe it's a question of looking through archive to begin to find what interests you and what captures your eye. And if there's just, we're not necessarily looking for, you know, excellent archival films. We're just looking for that moment or that shot or that sequence in a film that really captures our imagination, seems to speak to us at the current moment now. And that could be the starting point for your film or it could be a, a kind of a visual motif a recurring um, visual trope in your film that connects somehow to your experience or what you want, want to make a film about. Um, so, you know, your film could be about personal experience during lockdown. It could be about connecting with family and friends because that's so difficult now. Um, but also uh, there's a re renewed focus on connecting with family and friends because it's we're in, in these un unusual circumstances. And it gives us time to reflect on the personal and the political and family and society. And maybe we have more time to do that now and make films like this now than we would in the uh, early burly of, of normal everyday life under um, you know, the conditions um, prior to COVID-19. Um, so in terms of going on then and, and, and then asking what should I look for in the archive, as I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, it's really, um, you know, going on some of these websites and, and navigating to subjects of interest and trying to find the shots or the sequences um, are, the, are the little phrases within these films that really capture your imagination and that you think with the resources you have available um, make sense in the film you'd like to make now. So um, I've given you a lot of resources in terms of going out and finding kind of uh, audiovisual material but also uh, you need to think about whose voices, uh, whose voice or voices will we hear in the film? So think about, um, you know, are these voices going to be on screen? Do you want subjects speaking on screen? Do you want them off screen? Are they going to be members of your household or are they going to be via a Zoom call? Um, and who are they speaking to? If it's one person speaking, who are they speaking to? What's the mode of address? Are they reading a poem? Are they addressing a letter to someone? Are they speaking directly to the audience? So think about, think about the tone and think about the mode of address of, of whoever the key voices are in your film. Um, and also how archive material can help us reinterpret the past and the present through the clips you use and, and what they say about our current situation and what they say about what you're trying to say in the film. Um, so I think the more precise and the more rigorous you are in, 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 in getting these memorable uh, images from the past that have some resonance to us today, the more successful your film will be. So uh, at this point, I, I just take a break um, to show you a couple of films from in, for inspiration. On the next slide, um, I'll have several more that you can dip into. Um, but I'm just going to show you uh, short clips from these two films, which really look to, look to family um, um, in terms of their subject matter, but essentially could have been, could have been made in isolation. Um, and you'll, you'll see why in a moment. So I'm just gonna uh, stop sharing my presentation and then I'll navigate to my Chrome screen and um, I'll just get these going for you. 
So the first film um, is by Gemma Green Hope, and it's a favorite of mine in terms of showing it to students. So I'm just going to show you the first minute or so of this film. It's only about two and a half minutes, but I, re I recognize um, Zoom video is, can be a little bit choppy at times, so I'll, I'll limit it here. So I'll just show you a minute of this and um, I'll tell you why I like it. She loved books. She let me count them all and there were over a thousand. Her house was like a relic. It held memories of an ancient world. A world where the wild was still wild and people still worshipped the hearth. She remembered walking across the country for miles, homeless and cold, eating raw cabbages from a farmer's field. To use a cliche, she was an old soul. She spoke of fairies tugging at the power lines in the countryside. Up the airy mountain, down the rushy glen, we dared go a-hunting, for fear of little men. She was superstitious and religious, a palm-reading Christian. I would say that I'm an atheist, but I hope for her sake it's all true. She had a good, good heart. She was beautiful. I thank her for my eyebrows. She wore gypsy skirts and headscarves. She loved the outdoors. Okay, so I'm just going to stop that one there. And, um, you know, obviously the, the filmmaker is a very talented animator and illustrator and a great use of stop motion here. But what I like most about the film is um, the tone of it. You know, it's, it's basically a tribute to her um, grandmother as a, a lovely um, pace to it and, uh, and kind of meditative quality. And it, it isn't literal in terms of the relation between image and sound. It's uh, impressionistic in the flow of images, letting it kind of wash over us um, in terms of the life the grandmother lived related, uh, not just in photographs, but also in archival objects um, uh, placed in, a, in very interesting kind of combinations and interesting graphic um, settings uh, within the film. So there's a, a great deal of attention and, and detail gone into it, but you wouldn't have to be a great animator to do a similar um, tribute to a member of your family using these kind of archive materials in a more uh, conventional um, narrative. So I just wanted to show that as one uh, example um, that perhaps could inspire your own films. She grew black currants and raspberries and good I'm going to stop that one there and then go to the second film, Single Mother Only Daughter. I was slightly longer excerpt from this and it's essentially um, a single mother in um, Hong Kong um, talking to her daughter, who I believe is in LA. Um, so you'll get, you'll get a sense of it after we've watched it. Anyway, I've been in a little creative block lately. So that's why I wanted to ask if mm -hmm. I could interview you. Wow! I'm in an alleyway documentary! <laughs> oh! I have so many things that are swimming in my head. I don't know what... <laughs> I know, what's the sound about Messi? You know, one of them could maybe be about motherhood. I don't see how I could be ready for it at all because of what I saw through you, like how much you put yourself through. I don't think that would be a good documentary though. Okay. This is something I, I think about a lot. For all women who stopped being in the workforce mm -hmm. or who, who've never been in the mainstream workforce, mm -hmm. and then suddenly I come out, well, okay, so, and on some level, I do have a lot of, like experience, uh, with the financial freedom, uh, with the, but I do not have know-how and I am not a digital name. And there, mm. So for 18 years, your priority is your kid, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then of course you miss her, but there's also that huge freedom. So suddenly you feel like, oh, okay, my turn to do something. And then you find that, okay, you used to be top of the class always, and now you're always bottom of the mm -hmm. class. Because the other people, they never took an 18-year-old break. Right. An 18-year-long break. Right. Single mothers, when they don't have to mother full-time, yeah. then what? It's kind of funny, actually, that you say that, because in some ways, like, well, I know that you feel probably like, I don't need you to be my mom anymore, but... I actually really do miss that. Oh, thanks. No, no, I don't mean that, though. I know, I know. It's just that made me think of that, the way you said but, it. But when you say you do miss that, what do you miss? I don't know. I mean, I feel like since the Hank days, mm -hmm. I really feel like 
the roles reversed. I feel more like I have to mother you. I can tell you exactly when when you started being the mother when I wanted to commit suicide. And I think Okay, so I'm gonna stop that one there. It's a, it's a, I think about a nine minute film by Ellie Wen. Again, a incredible film. But um, again, I think what I find interesting is the fact that they're, they're apart, they're in different countries and the filmmaker has set it up so that she appears on screen. So we get her reactions and then they confront a kind of a traumatic incident um, from earlier in their life um, in a very uh, moving and engaging way. And, and also we're, we're let in on the process of making the film and all the archival objects that, that stir this memory. So I think it's a very effective film and a film that could have been made under the lockdown conditions today as well. So uh, I think it's kind of interesting um, to show you tonight. So uh, just returning to my PowerPoint, so I don't have too long, too long left on this. Um, so I'm going to, on the, on the PDF that will be uploaded later that you'll get access to, and I think maybe email to you, um, you'll get another six films um, that you can digest and you can also you know, obviously see the full um, versions of Gangan and Single Mother Only Daughter. But, um, and my mouse is doing strange things to me there. Um, Dad Stick is a film by John, John Smith, again, uh, looking at archive uh, as an archival object, not just archive footage. And we have a similar approach from Victoria Maplebeck. Uh, with 160 characters where she digs out an old Nokia mobile phone and revisits a past relationship, looking at over hundred texts exchanged on that old mobile phone and, and, and basically the, the traje trajectory of our relationship that didn't work out. So again, I think some of these can give you ideas uh, for what you can do with the archive. These are the hands, this is a recent BFI film in praise of the NHS that draws heavily on their a kind of archive uh, film about the NHS since, uh, you know, its conception in 1948. And then I've also put in a couple of links for isolation films that don't necessarily have archive film, um, but give you a sense of the kind of films people are making now in isolation. So one was for the New York Times based in um, China, I think it was, and, and the other was a student film made in isolation, um, which again, I think is a very effective uh, depiction of um, self-isolation by the filmmaker. Okay, so my final tips, uh, just rounding up, would be, um, you know, bring us into a world we haven't seen before. Um, there are certain unique things about your life and your family that maybe you haven't seen represented on film before, and, and maybe the archive can help you um, show where your family's come from, show the depth of your, your family history and family experience uh, in a way that we haven't seen on screen, particularly in a short doc. Uh, connect the past and the present in new and surprising ways. So uh, going to the next point, avoid visual cliches. I mean, really hunt out kind of the archive that you haven't seen before, rather than just repeating the archive that's shown again and again um, to record the anniversary of a certain event. Um, tell an engaging story that moves our emotions. I think the editor, Walter Murch, typically says that uh, story and emotion are the key things that drives any film, whether it be fiction or documentary. And I, I think you can sense from the two films that I've shown you, even from those short snippets, um, that they've got both of those qualities working for them. Don't include low, low quality images or pixelated video. I mean, obviously, obviously if it's a very important footage or very important home movies that just carries us anyway, despite its quality, I mean, go for it. But, but generally look for higher quality images if, if you can find them. And, and try and make sure that the video isn't pixelate, pixelated or deinterlaced for web use. Um, if you look up what deinterlacing means, just to make sure that um, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a quality viewing experience. And uh, don't use a wall of music. You know, use voices, use natural and fan sound. Work on your sound design, um, even in a in a very kind of fundamental, elemental way. But don't just cluster music um, of the documentary. Um, I think. The, the relation between the archival elements, the personal elements, the image and the sound, the natural and the found sound and the competing voices of the singular voice in your film and can give it its power rather than just uh, putting music over it just to, to, to quicken the pace or to kind of give it a, a kind of animated feel. And make it personal. Most of all, make it personal so that um, it's something 
that's of meaning to you and by sharing it um, people uh, other people can be brought into this world that they haven't seen before and uh, it can be a, an engaging experience um, for all of us under these current conditions. So before I finish, I just wanted to give a plug for a symposium that we hope will happen. Um, it's still to be, to be confirmed, but the Archives for Education scheme um, that I've been working on, we're hoping, as I say, to open it out to young filmmakers, um, beyond higher education to young filmmakers. So uh, we'll be spending a day at BFI Site Bank in September talking about this in more detail. So it'll be a free symposium. So if you'd like to come along, just go to the website and sign up through Eventbrite. Uh, there's a link on the website and uh, hopefully I'll see some of you there. Um, so that's my presentation. Maybe Jenny can come back and, and, and uh, put any questions to me. And uh, thanks very much for your attention. There we go. Uh, Shane, thank you so much. That was so fascinating and so much useful information for everybody to digest. That is wonderful. Um, so to anyone listening, uh, if you have questions, now's the time uh, to put them into your chat function uh, and I will pose them to Shane. And we've had a couple coming through. So uh, to start off, Olivia has asked, can you recommend any sites that specialize in old 16 mil or super eight footage? Mm. <laughs> a tricky, okay. yeah. a tricky one to start you off. The first question. Um, off the top of my head, I can't. But but if you email me, I'll, I'll have a route around. I mean, it doesn't doesn't come to mind. Generally, um, all of the sites that I find that are of use for the Archives for Education scheme, I put up in the FAQ on the Archives for Education website. And so that'll have some sources that I haven't talked about tonight. So so have a check through those. Um, but I've tried to be as comprehensive uh, as I can in that FAQ in terms of what's available. Thank you. But I think, but I think what you'll find is um, recent digitization efforts um, do tend to be of um, work that originates on film. So I think if you, do, if you do look at the US National Archives, generally what they do is they digitize 35 mil or 16 mil and they produce these kind of 1080p um, HD um, you know, digitalizations that just abs look absolutely pristine and absolutely wonderful and really enhance the production value of your film. Mm. Um, Piotr has asked, uh, we're getting into nitty gritty of um, licensing now. Yeah. If a film I used archive in was screened at a film festival, would that be seen as commercial use under the Creative Commons license, uh, brackets with non-commercial specification? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting one. And this is something that we're trying to navigate with the partners on the Ar Archives for Education scheme as well, because obviously if students make films that they want to go on and show at festivals, what's the definition of uh, commercial use and non-commercial use? I mean, the problem with festivals is that obviously they charge an admission fee and also potentially they have cash prizes for some of the winners of the competitions. So there are kind of nuances there in terms of um, what's commercial and what's non-commercial. I, I would say, um, Creative Commons is fine in terms of making your film. When you want to show it somewhere, you need to go to whoever the rights holder was and, and make sure in the, in, the, in the case of festivals um, that they either, either approve you um, playing in the festival or you, you, you start a conversation with them over the life of the film and, and, and how you can work together. That would be my best advice, I think, on that. And generally, just to be really specific on it, who's the onus with to have that copyright cleared? You as a filmmaker or the platform that it's being shown on, if it's social media or the festival it's being shown on? Yeah, I mean, I think that the festival will, also, will always, in the application process, um, get you to say as the filmmaker that you have the rights to all, all the material in the film. So the onus is always on the filmmaker uh, to be clear in your mind that you have the rights. And as I've said, if you are using a piece of copyrighted film, um, that you're clear in your mind that, you know, is this the, the use that you're making in the film, um, you can claim fair use or fair dealing for that particular use. So I think this has become very popular among filmmakers, documentary filmmakers going to Sundance, for example. Um, there was a very well-known um, copyright firm um, based in LA who will basically look at these uh, feature documentaries and they'll go through them with a fine tooth comb and they'll look at each use of each piece of archival, archival material and they'll, they'll make a statement as a lawyer that I believe this, this um, satisfies the requirements of fair use and therefore we didn't have to pay for a license. Mm -hmm. but, um, but you know, at, at, at that level, you do need to bring the lawyers in to, to make sure that your fair use or fair dealing is legitimate. Um, but the onus is on the filmmaker to, to, to do that at some point in the process. 
So as a as a, uh, a sort of rule of thumb, if you believe that you're using footage legally under fair use or fair dealing, um, yeah. do you do you would you just have the arguments clear in your mind, or would you produce supplementary material that you could show if required? Well, I mean, if if endowed for a commercial project, you would also you, you would obviously engage a lawyer. But uh, you know, at short film level, um, I would be clear in my mind that you satisfy the provisions of fair use or fair dealing, and also weigh up the risk of you know whoever the the rights owner is, um, you know, presuming you know send, sending you a letter saying the use isn't fair. Uh, in my own um, in my own experience, I made a film on uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, who was you know the 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 allegedly the assassin of uh, John, John F. Kennedy, uh, President Kennedy. And um, the whole notion of the Zupruder film, which was bought by the US government for $16 million, but now has to be licensed by, from a museum in Dallas. And if you use even one second of the Zupruder film in a commercial context, uh, you will, as I find out to my, to my cost, be sent a, a legal letter by FedEx the next day. So I had to pull the use of the Zupruder film from my, from my film, even though, you know, in my in my eyes, it is a, a, a you know in the public domain and, and should be used for the purposes of quotation, criticism, or review in the context of the Kennedy killing. So it's a, it's a very kind of knotty area, but um, I think that the best practice is all, always to start a discussion with the rights holders. I think that the one thing that we've done with the Archives for Education scheme is instead of ripping material and using it illegally, actually go to the sources of some of this material. And engage them. They they they're really interested in, in making this film. Uh, a lot of these archive ar archive films available for educational use and available to young filmmakers to to practice their craft. So engage them in a conversation. And you know, in most cases, I th I think they'll be very helpful uh, to young filmmakers trying to use this material. Um, I've got a question that is from YouTube, I think. Uh, I would like to hear more about using TV archival footage, especially when we would like to take a more critical approach toward the way the news is being reported. Thanks. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that satisfies the, the fair dealing argument, you know, for the purposes of quotation, criticism and review. Um, and we see it in terms of, you know, remixes and mashups on YouTube all the time. Um, so you can make fan footage films as long as you're not taking extended clips from one source, um, I, I think you're fine. And, and there's a whole other, in terms of film studies, you know, analyzing, um, you know, certain director's style, there's a whole, um, there's a whole other kind of world of fan footage films and video and audio visual essays online that also may, may grab people's fancy for these competitions. So um, In Transition is one, uh, one website you can look, look at for that. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody called 394926 says, how soon does something become archive? Well, I mean, you could say as soon as it's recorded. Um, you know, but we could, we could go into a, a, a philosophical discussion. Um, but I guess in terms of the, I guess in terms of um, audiovisual archives, they, would, they might say once it's deposited and once it's processed and when, once it's made available in a collection, once it's digitized, once it's open for the public to use. But then you could see, you could see YouTube as an archive, you could see Vimeo as an archive. So, and, and you could see some of the websites that I pointed to tonight as an archive. So, um, and, 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 and we certainly want to archive um, our experience during the current situation. And, uh, you know, I, and I know a lot of radical political movements they're very conscious of documenting any situation they're involved in. So we have an archive, so we can be part of creating an archive for future generations. So I, I think we could take a many-sided view of, of what the archive is um, and, you know, respect uh, the copyright of the, of the rights owner, but also try and enforce um, our rights through these exceptions to copyright law where we can to make our voices heard and to preserve freedom of expression and to let many documentaries kind of bloom. Uh, more, on the, um, more on those copyright questions, actually. Uh, what do we need to do if we've tried to reach the copyright owners on multiple occasions via email slash phone, but they don't reply? Yeah, so um, I, I think in that, case, in that case, you've made your best effort to contact the rights owners. Um, you also need to make your best efforts in terms of tracking down the paper trail in terms of who actually owns the rights uh, to the footage. 
And then it's just a question of your judgment call as to, you know, whether under these copyright exceptions, you have the right to use the material under fair use or fair dealing, and, and then you proceed. But I think you can only do your best in terms of chasing down the rights holders. But if you, if you believe your use of it satisfies um, the legal requirements, um, then go ahead, but obviously at your risk. So, um, you know, until you get that legal, legal letter and either you challenge it or you accept it, or you get legal guidance before playing in a festival um, and so on. Uh, I mean, obviously it is, it is difficult because when you're going back to archive from the 50s, 60s and 70s, sometimes the production company is no longer around, the filmmaker is long dead. Um, the family may not be even aware that there are a copy of, uh, of their films floating around. So you do have to be careful. So you have to, you know, think, think of it in terms of, you know, in, in, in 20 or 30 years time, what would you like people to be doing with your films? You mightn't, you mightn't like them uh, to be taking experts, excerpts of your films um, to put an argument that's completely the opposite of what you in initially intended in terms of the film you were making. So um, I think it's a judgment call um, and an ethical you know, call on the part of the filmmaker. But, uh, and it's, 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 not an easy, it's not an easy call, but I guess if you, if you do have the budget, um, these copyright lawyers and, and, and proper copyright advice um, can produce the legal letter that can kind of get you off the hook in many cases, or at least give you some assurance, I, I should say, be a better term for it. Um, on a more uh, creative note, as a filmmaker yourself, do you have any tips for um, if people are pulling together material that's from different sources? Uh, you've talked about, you know, redigitized high def material, yeah. uh, lots of old material and personal archive. Um, how do you blend these things to make a kind of cohesive film? Yeah, I mean, I, I think on Children of, of the Revolution, there was probably half of that film was, was archive. And I tried to go with the HD elements or material that was in, um, you know, the best preserved state generally to make sure that it was just a, a completely engrossing watch and you weren't thrown out of it at any stage by, um, by the quality of the material. And you, you really notice around, I don't know when it was, maybe late late 70s, early 80s, where they stopped making news reports on film and they started making them on, on quite poor video, you know, by mm -hmm. modern standards. So, um, you know, and I, and I chose not, re not to really go down there. I, I chose to, to, to go with the archive that had come off um, that had originally been shot on film, so it gave a kind of unified look across the film. But um, but I but I think these days, in terms of a short documentary, I think we can we can mix and match. Um, and it's not even talking about mix and matching film and video, film, video, um, gifts, stuff from the internet. You know, um, all sorts of mixed media, just to, just to let let it wash over you and create this impressionistic world that you're trying to create. So uh, I'm not too sure. Kind of younger filmmakers care care that much about the the formal aesthetics of there are the unifying principles of archive in that way anymore. Okay, more questions coming in from YouTube. I think if we can keep you for just a couple more. Please. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, do you think that more docs which feature archives and slash past stories will get commissioned by mainstream broadcasters? Yeah, I mean, I, I hope so. I know there's there's some sort of agreement between the B BBC and BFI, um, which allows the BBC to use a certain amount of BFI um, archive every year. So, um, but the current, you know, uncertainty over the future of BBC Four, for example, um, puts that at risk because I think a lot of that content went on on BBC Four. So, um, I think I was I was surprised when I first approached the BFI and approached the BBC. That they're actually hungry to get this material out there and uh, they're just looking for ways to do it particularly for education and for non-commercial use i know the Shef sheffield documentary festival also for several years every year they kind of supported the making of a feature documentary using some bfi material maybe bbc material uh, to make very accomplished kind of uh, fan footage films so uh, I, I hope it's something that we can continue and, and grow as part of this kind of archives for education initiative and through events like this, just making people realize the power of archive, where to find it, and that you don't have to rip it from YouTube. You can actually work with some of the um, some of the rights holders to take uh, our audiovisual heritage and and kind of revive it and reanimate it and repurpose it for the present day. So we we have a better understanding of who we were and, and who we are during this situation and how we can go forward um, as a society. 
Um, just two more if we can squeeze them in. Uh, yeah. you have, you've worked so hard on getting the platform Archives for Education up and running for higher education. Uh, what about those who have, who have left education and have to fund themselves? Yeah, so I think, obviously I, I work at Kingston University, so initially this was about finding footage for my students to use. Um, and in terms of, you know, rights holders wanting some assurance in terms of how the material will be used, what they did was they, they got the institution, so all of the universities signed up to a licensing agreement with the BFI and the BBC to use the footage under certain conditions. Two minutes, excerpts of up to two minutes can be used. And, and they couldn't be you know, put up on YouTube or put in a festival without some negotiation with the rights holders, BBC and BFI. So we're looking to, to gradually extend the scheme. So again, we can work with third parties like maybe Bertha Duck House or with training organizations or with schools to, um, to extend the reach of the scheme. So we realize there's, there's a lot of potential non-commercial uses of this archive out there for, people, for young filmmakers or amateur filmmakers. Um, so we're looking for ways to do that, but it will, it will, it will probably be, be licensed through a third party. So if you work with some community, community group, the community group could sign the license agreement with the BBC or BFI, and then they could download the material to make available to the members of the community group, you know, something like that. So it's, some, it's still something that's evolving, but it's something very much on the agenda uh, with the BFI, BBC and some other partners that we're talking to uh, in terms of growing the scheme. That's amazing. That's really exciting stuff. I'm just going to squeeze in one more. It's quite a nice uh, thought. Um, this person, I think another YouTube says, I bought some 1960s holiday videos, which I found in a charity shop, and I don't have any idea who originally recorded them. Uh, what's the deal with copyright there? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, in, in that kind of situation, you, you wouldn't have a clue um, where it came from. I mean, you could do your best efforts to identify the people in the footage and so on. Um, but uh, I think it's going to be difficult. Um, that, to my understanding, would, would fit the definition of an orphan film, where we don't know the parents of the film or the owners of the film. And until we do, we, you know, we can, we can make creative reuse of the film. But once, you know, members of the family, they might see it on YouTube or whatever, they might, they might see it's their relative. They might be very very into what you've done with the home movie or the granny or whatever and they may ask you to take it down so um that might be the situation in, in that case but again the, you know I'm, I'm basing this on my experience i would recommend that you um you, you speak to bart maletti at learning on screen or attend one of his workshops or one of his courses because he actually lays out in in, in his course certain scenarios like this uh, in terms of what you would do in any given situation so he can be a great resource if you have a uh, you know, kind of a complicated uh, situation like that to get a, a legal view on. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a comprehensive uh, overview um, and so much information to go away and uh, research further. Um, I need to make a quick apology because I've heard that during that, the chat function on Zoom uh, crashed. Um, so I'm really sorry to anybody that was trying to write their questions to you that way. Um, just to let everybody know, uh, Shane has agreed to take over the Doc House Twitter account uh, for uh, about an hour now. So if that's still okay, yeah. Uh, if you want to, if you didn't get a chance uh, to ask your question or I didn't get a chance to get to it, then you can um, tweet at us. So just go on to Bertha Duck House's Twitter account and Shane will be able to answer a few more questions on there. Um, and just to let everybody know that if you want to hear more about how to make an archive doc, uh, we have another session coming up. Our next session is with David Warlow from London Screen Archive. And that's gonna be an Instagram live session um, with Rain Dance at 1 p.m. on Friday the 29th of May. So that's a week today at 1 p.m. Uh, if you go onto our Instagram account. Um, and that just leaves me uh, time to say a huge thank you to Dr. Shane O'Sullivan. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely fantastic and um, we look forward to being in touch with you again. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, pleasure. Okay, thank you. Good night. See you on Twitter. Bye. <laughs>